So I'm going to talk about two topics that I've worked on a lot, and that is appearance and glare from building integrated flow voltaics. And so let's go to the agenda. So the first thing I will, will cover is some basics on how we can describe colors, um, how we can do that in a quantitative manner, um, how our human color vision works, how color is created in BIPV systems, and what uh, power losses are associated with them. And this first section will be a bit technical, uh, so fair warning for that. So let's start. What are colors? Basically, there are two main groups of colors, spectral colors, so monochromatic colors. And these basically arrive from the, the visible spectrum of light. So if we look at the, the visible spectrum of light from 380 to 750 nanometers, we can see that each wavelength corresponds to a, to a certain color. Um, but then there are also some other colors out there which are non-spectral in nature. So that would be uh, grayscale colors, for example, ranging from black to white or shade. So if you mix a grayscale color with one of these spectral colors to get brown or orange, uh, uh, sorry, uh, um, pink or something like that. And then there's also some impossible colors out there like magenta, which is a mixture between blue and red so we actually have two, two monochromatic stimuli or some metallic colors, which more rely on their reflective properties instead of the, the spectrum of reflected light. And then there's also a number of colors we humans simply cannot see, but other organisms or animals might be able to in the infrared or the ultraviolet. So how does the human color vision work? You might remember this from high school, but basically our visual system in the eye is made up of a focusing system. So a series of lenses, and then our receptive system, our retina at the back of the eye, which basically consists of a lot of photoreceptors. In the case of us humans, we have two main kinds of photoreceptors. So uh, the rods, which are mainly used for low light vision. So for example, in, in dark conditions, and there we don't really have a lot of uh, um, differentiation between colors. The main color vision arises from the so-called cones, um, which gives us daylight vision, color vision. And there's in fact three types of cones. So blue cones, green cones, and red cones. And what you can see in this graph here is their individual um, absorption spectra. So we can see that the receptive areas of each of these cones is shifted by wavelength, which also explains why they can see blue, green, and red light. So how can we approximate that human color vision when describing uh, color we can measure somewhere in nature? We can do that by using so-called color matching functions. And these basically have been um, determined from uh, human experiments in the 1920s, um, which resulted in these three color matching functions, one for each of these primary colors, blue, green, and red. And then if we use a certain reflection spectrum or a spectrum emitted from a light source and multiply that with this color matching function, we can arrive at so-called color coordinates. Um, the one that is recommended by the International Lighting Commission is this XYZ color coordinates, which directly arise from the, the color matching functions from here. So what we get from that is if we measure a certain spectrum shown here in black of a certain object, and we multiply that with the three color matching functions, we end up with three uh, slightly different functions. And then if we integrate each one of those over the, uh, the full wavelength range they cover, we arrive at these three color coordinates, x, y, and z. And then each of these is associated to a certain color. So for example, this shade of green, has these three color coordinates, 56, 67, 54. 
And that basically works for all colors in the human uh, visual range. But in fact, there's a lot of different color spaces out there. So these color coordinates belong to the CAE 1931 XYZ color space, but you might actually be more familiar with the RGB color spaces. And these have their own color matching functions, for example, shown here. These RGB color spaces are very commonly used in, in technical uh, context. And it stands for red, green, and blue, as you might imagine. And it's mainly used for digital displays. In fact, there is actually a number of RGB systems out there. A lot of them are proprietary. So as you can see here, there's an Adobe one, there's a Profoto one, and so on. And the strange thing about them is that they cover different parts of the visible range of, of human perception. So this gamut that is shown here covers all the colors we humans can see. And then each of these RGB spaces shown as triangles are the areas that can be of colors that can be represented in that space. That is also why color displays usually cannot make very good differentiation in the green area where our human eye can see much better than the uh, color displays usually work. You can also see they only cover part of the visible spectrum, which is what I just explained. If we go from display screens to printings, we usually use a different system, this CMYK for cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, which are the primary inks used in printing. And that results in this tetragonal shape here in the color space. And as you can also see here, that covers a much smaller and uh, quite different area of the vis uh, visual range of humans. And that's also one of the reasons why the display and print colors might be different. So these are very device dependent. If we don't want to use these technical color spaces, but color spaces for actual uh, accurate descriptions of colors, uh, we usually rely on the International Commission on Illumination. Um, and the initial color spaces they proposed were the CAE 1931 XYZ and RGB color spaces, which I showed before. And the simplest one of those, this XYZ color space, where I showed the derivation before, can actually be transformed into an even simpler color space, the XYY space. And you've seen this gamut, gamut before as well. And here we just use an X variable, a small X and the small Y to characterize the hue or the tone of a color. And then we have a third axis, which is not shown here, which basically goes through the screen, um, which is the brightness of a color. And if we look at all the colors that are visible to the human eye as a gamut in this 3D space, we end up with something like this. However, what was very quickly noticed is that this is not a very accurate representation of uh, human perception. So it's not very perceptually uniform. Um, if, if we go back here, the human eye is actually able to distinguish a lot more colors in the blue range than this color space would show. So that's why in 1976, the CIE developed additional color spaces, the LAB color space, um, which is used for colorful surfaces and dyes, and the LUV color space, which is used for displays. Um, and both of these use the same L star parameter for the lightness. So that's in this case, the vertical axis. And then they use either an A and B uh, variable or a U and B variable to determine the, the color tone or chromaticity. And these color spaces are much better in the perceptual uniformity. So if you go one step in the blue area or you go one step in the green area, that corresponds to approximately the same uh, differential ability in, in humans to perceive colors. However, it's still not perfect, especially in the blue region. So the CAE went back to drawing board and came up with even more complicated color spaces or so-called color appearance models. And these were based on the CAE LAB, but they take additional phenomena into account. 
For example, imagine that you have light sources with a different color tone. So in this case, uh, an orange light source and a more bluish light source, and you illuminate the same object, the measured uh, reflections from these objects will be different because they were illuminated by different light. However, our eyes can compensate for that to a large part, which is called chromatic adaptation. And that is something that is not taken into account in CAE LAB, but taken into account in these more complicated models. And then there's a lot of other effects that are taken into account, like uh, correlation between background color and brightness and contrast and their influences on each other. But in essence, it means that these models become much more complicated and require a lot more input variables to accurately describe a color. So if we're talking about color description in uh, BAPV contexts, that goes way beyond the scope. And I'm going to show a few graphs that actually use the CAE LAB color space because that is good enough for comparison. So what is the CAE LAB color space actually? Um, it relies on a so-called standard observer like the CAE XYZ uh, color space, which makes it device independent. So whether you describe a color on paper or on a different material or on a, a digital display, the color will always be the same. It also uses a reference white, and that means that it compensates partially for different illumination conditions. So it takes into account what conditions illuminate our sample. Um, and in order to make these variables comparable, we refer everything back to a reference white. And in our case, that will be the D65 standard illuminant, which basically means daylight conditions. So we're only interested in how do the colors compare when they're illuminated by sunlight uh, approximately. So how do we get to the CAE LAB values? We have the XYZ coordinate of a color that we measured as I showed before. So we have these color matching functions and arrive at these three variables. And then we have our reference white point, which is also defined by some color coordinates. And then we apply a lot of uh, fancy equations and then end up at a number of uh, color coordinates here. Um, this process is not too complicated, but there are some, uh, some pitfalls one might run into. Anyway, once we have these LAB color coordinates, we can go into interpreting them. Before we get to that, I just wanted to mention that you might be more familiar with some other sort of color systems or charts or palettes like the Ariel RAL system in Germany or the Pantone color matching system, which annually uh, publishes their color of the year or some other systems that are used worldwide. But these are not actually color spaces. They do not provide a way to describe a color out in the world. They are mainly databases which contain a limited number of colors with either physical or digital representations, and they can be used for selecting colors. But if you just compare them to a color you find out in the wild, um, that might not be possible in all cases. However, most of these systems have defined color coordinates, usually in the CAE LAB color space. Getting to these values, however, is a different issue because some of them are very proprietary and especially Pantone is not willing to share any data on their colors. But back to the topic at hand, the next few slides I will spend on describing some of these color metrics. And uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is the, the lightness, this L star, which is also used in the CAE LAB color space. And that ranges basically from black to white, but can also be applied to colors, and basically describes the uh, total reflection of a surface as it is perceived by a human. So if we look at this graph here, all these colors have the same lightness in the, in the column, but they have different color tones. And in order to achieve this comparison, we always compare it to a similarly lit, perfectly white object. The luminance, conversely, which is also described by, by an L, but missing the star, is a measured quantity. So that really describes the uh, 
luminous intensity from a, emitted from a surface or a light source. Um, there is also the radiance, which is the corresponding radiometric quantity. And that basically means one of them measures in candela and the other one measures in, in watts uh, per, per unit angle and, and uh, area. Um, so these are measurement quantities. And then one other um, metric you might run across that is the brightness. And that basically uh, describes how do we actually perceive these reflections or emissions from a certain surface. Because it doesn't only correspond to the total reflections, but it also depends on what surrounds these colors. So for example, these gray areas in column A and column B are exactly the same lightness and therefore also emit the same luminance, but they have a quite different brightness because there is a different background around them. If we now go from uh, brightness or lightness descriptions to color descriptions, um, the colorfulness is actually not very well defined. So it's basically the degree of difference from a color to gray, but that doesn't tell us much. What we use instead is the chroma, which is basically the colorfulness referred to a white color under similar conditions. So the same way as we determined the lightness in the CAE LAB color space. And if we look at the color wheel, that could, for example, be the, um, the, the Euclidean distance in, in this color space, if that is in a CAE LAB color space. Um, similarly, the saturation compares this chroma or the colorfulness to the lightness of a color. Because of course, um, a very dark color will never be, appear as saturated as, as, as something that is very bright. So that is uh, chroma over the lightness approximately. And then we have the hue, which basically, as I mentioned before, already describes the color tone. And that is usually given as an angular quantity. So the angle in this color wheel would be the hue. Then I want to touch on a few more aspects of color generation, especially as they confer to BIPV. So the first one of those is metamerism. And if you remember back on the one of the first slides, I showed these color matching functions of the human eye. However, that we only have three of these receptor types means that different spectra can lead to the same response of our human eye. So what that means is if we have an object that is illuminated by an either a yellow light or a combination of LEDs with uh, certain distributions, both parts of this white area might look completely the same even though the measured reflectance spectra are different. And that, of course, also confers to a BIPV operation. So depending on how much of a spectrum is reflected from a, a surface, from a BIPV surface or so on, um, that will also have an effect on the efficiency. And we can see here different PV technologies have different spectral responses or quantum efficiencies. So some of them absorb more in the infrared, like silicon, versus most thin film technologies, which mostly absorb in the visible range. And therefore, tuning the color of a BIPV system um, has a large effect on both how we perceive it and how that affects the performance of BIPV systems. So. You've heard me talk a lot about fundamentals of describing colors and so on. Now I want to really go into how can we create these colors in BIPV systems. After all, um, the color nature of BIPV systems or hiding a PV system in a building is one of the major selling points, especially to architects for BIPV. And basically we can achieve this color in two ways. We can either use pigments, and in that case, a part of our incident sunlight is absorbed in these pigments and basically lost to us in our system. And then a very similar spectrum is both converted to electricity 
and reflect it to an observer. And depending on which part of the visible spectrum remains, we will perceive a certain color. Now, we lose a lot of the visible spectrum here, and we also reflect a large part of the non-visible spectrum here, which you can see in the black parts here. So that means these pigments are prone to have a low efficiency. So there's an alternative for that, and that is so-called structural colors, which are based on thin film stacks, and I will explain that in a few slides. But basically, they select which parts of the spectrum to reflect and which to transmit and then convert to electricity. And in that case, we can, for example, only reflect the visible light, which leads to a very bright color appearance, and convert all the other non-visible parts to electricity. And that would, of course, mean that it has a much higher efficiency. Um, before I go through all these technologies, I just wanted to quickly mention that the reflections from PV do not only depend on whether we use pigments or structural colors, but also on the surface glass. So whenever we have a surface, we get specular reflections, so mirror-like reflections from flat surfaces, or diffuse reflections from rough surfaces. And whenever we change material interfaces, so basically going from air to glass or a different material, we will see some amount of reflections. And basically that's a, a physical principle of, of the so-called Fresnel reflections, which correlate with, correlates with the refractive indices between these two materials. So if we go from air, which has a refractive index from one, to glass, which has a reflective index of 1.5 approximately, then we will see about 5% reflections. If we go to a material with higher index, we might see higher reflections. And the way we usually describe that in PV um, is, yeah. So one, one more thing to mention here is that this actually increases with uh, incidence angle. So this equation holds true for normal incidence. So when the light goes directly against the glass plate, but if it is angled, so like this picture here, the angle of incidence increases these reflections. And that can be described with the so-called incidence angle modifier in PV. And that's just an experimental measure of these increased reflections. Um, and we measure that by measuring the short circuit current at a certain incidence angle and comparing that to the uh, the reflection or the, the short circuit card we would see at, at a normal incidence. So why is it important to also consider these reflections? Well, basically they can lead to glare. So whenever we have these specular reflections from a surface, they can uh, cause annoying reflections. And in order to avoid that, we can use rough surfaces. So we have more diffuse reflections and for that, we have a lot of possibilities. So we can either have structured glass, so macro textured glass, or we can satinate or frost glass. Um, and that's usually done with acid etching. And my second presentation after the next break will deal mostly with glare. So I'll not spend more time on this here. But back to the coloring technologies. Um, I mentioned we have pigments and we have structural colors. And pigments are usually applied to the inside of glass via digital printing. So we use some ceramic inks that are then fritted or baked in a high temperature process on the glass surface, which creates a very, very strong and durable enamel. Um, you have quite a lot of freedom of choice with this. So you can choose different colors or you can also choose different patterns. Um, however, there are not really that many inks on the market that are really optimized for PV applications. What that means is these pigments absorb a lot of sunlight. So you lose transmission and therefore also lose efficiency in your uh, PV module. There's also some um, screen printing animal technologies, but they are less common. So mostly we are dealing with screen printing here. If that is too inflexible, because you have to print it on the glass directly, you can also use colored interlayers. So these are also based on pigments, but 
instead of applying it directly to glass, they're applied to a carrier medium. So either some polymer films or some fabrics, which then get laminated between the surface glass and the PV cell with an additional layer of encapsulant. And they provide a much higher flexibility because you can easily cut them just with uh, a knife. Um, and you can also produce them in a roll-to-roll -roll process, whereas the inkjet printing needs large machinery um, that has to work in a batch process. There's also some ideas of laminating on top of the glass instead of in between, but this is the, the most common solution. And you can see here, it actually appears uh, quite colorful in the end. But still, it suffers from the same issues that these inks are not really optimized for PV applications. So if we look at the performance and we've measured some samples with ceramic inks and some samples with colored interlayers, you can see that depending on the color and depending on the pigments used, we lose between 10, 20 to 50% uh, of the performance of our PV models. And that's because most of the sunlight is just simply um, absorbed in the pigments um, and then partially reflected back to an observer. Additionally, we also saw that we have some additional IM losses. So we see additional reflection losses at higher incidence angles because um, we have an additional layer with a higher refractive index within our module stack. So that's also something to keep aware when you're, when you're modeling. So these technologies usually look nice, but are not very efficient. The second type we could use are structural colors. Um, and these are inspired by nature. So these morpho butterflies, which have this very iridescent uh, wings, and you might have seen them in pictures before. But basically what that is, it's a thin film or a stack of thin films applied to the inside of glass. Um, which makes it quite inflexible and it's also an expensive and time consuming process. Um, but what you end up with is uh, a layer of, of thin films with a certain thickness, which corresponds to the wavelength of light you want to reflect. And then according to these Fresnel reflections, whenever you have a transition between two materials, you reflect some light and by reflecting lights from the top and the bottom surface of each thin film layer, you can then get constructive or destructive interference of the reflected light and thereby color your samples. There is one issue with that, however. Different wavelengths react differently. And as soon as you increase the angle of incidence, the path length of light in your material also gets longer. And that means that the wavelengths at which you see constructive or destructive interference change as well. So that means you have a high angular dependency. If you look at the, at the same building from different angles, or the light comes from different angles, the color changes completely, which is also known as iridescence. And you can see that here in the case of the Copenhagen International School, um, when it's lit at a certain time of day and you're standing in the good location, you can see that some parts of the building look very greenish, green to bluish, versus other parts of the building which have exactly the same PV modules that look very dark and uh, desaturated. And you can actually measure that. And uh, I don't want to go into details on how you measure it. But basically, these plots show the LAB colors of different combinations of incidence and view angles. And what we can see here is that for inkjet printed colors, we see a very small cluster of very similar colors. So that looks the same from basically every angle. Whereas the structural colors that were used in this Copenhagen International School, from some angles, it appears blue, from others, it appears violet, and from even others, it appears very dark. So you don't really get any colorful reflections. And that's the primary issue with these uh, structural colors. They have, however, a much lower performance impact. So while they might not look, look as nice or 
they're less universally applicable because of their special uh, nature of reflections. They have much lower uh, absorption losses or almost no absorption losses and therefore very low transmission losses, which you can see in the efficiency of the samples here, which are above 90 or 95 percent. However, since they rely on these Fresnel reflections, they still have these additional IM losses, which can amount to yeah up to 5% uh, in total performance over a full year, um, depending on installation location. So that's nice. But more applicable still are the, the pigments or absorption based coloring just because they have a much higher flexibility and they are um, they are more universally applicable due to due to their more homogeneous appearance so why not improve the performance and there actually was a, a study in 2018 where um, some scientists investigated how can we optimize or what would be the optimal spectra of, of reflectant colors? Um, and what they found is that you can actually use two of these pill boxes or very sharp reflection spectra to achieve the same color as a very broad spectrum. And with that, you can basically achieve every color in the, in the human visible range. Or in this case, they just looked at the colors included in the RAL color standard. And they could show that if you had these optimized uh, graphs, uh, these optimized reflectance spectra, you would be able to achieve every color below five to 10 uh, percent power loss with the exception of some of the whites because for white colors, you just need to reflect a lot more. So there's huge potential for optimizing these colors. However, currently the industry still operates uh, on a trial and error basis and uh, most of the colored modules on the market are much lower efficiency than these uh, theoretical limits. So I hope that gave you a nice overview of what is out there in terms of coloring technologies and how they achieve coloring. Um, so let's have some questions and then have another break. Thank you, Marcus. So if you have some question, use the chat or you can raise your hand as before. So wait for some questions in the chat, and I have also some questions. So I will begin and let the audience take time to, to write their question. So if I understand well, the I, because you were speaking only about the glass or the color of the glass plus the, the cell. Because the cell also already has its own reflective uh, index and uh, and color, so you already have some a basis. You you cannot make everything. No, it's uh, how do you? Yes, that so so that is true. You that already is... have reflections from the cell itself, but that is not something you can avoid in any PV system. So usually you have the PV cell where you put an anti-reflective coating on, and then there's the encapsulant. So maybe if we go to one of these, yeah. Let's ignore the, the thin film coating for now. So usually on top of your PV cell, you have this anti-reflective coating. So you get lower Fresnel reflections there. And then you have the encapsulant, which is very well index matched to the glass. So you have almost no reflections between the glass and the encapsulant. The main reflections you will have is from the top side of the glass. That is usually these 5% due to Fresnel reflections. And then from the PV cell, you will have a few more percents. Um, but if you now include a coloring material, you will get increased reflections from this surface, not only due to Fresnel reflections, but also due to absorption and emission of these colorings. Or in case of a thin film coating, due to these uh, um, uh, interference from the reflected light. Does that explain or does that help? Yeah, thank you. And um, my second question is, uh, so a good glass on uh, uh, layers with glass and capsulant and so on is something that has a very high 
transparency and a very low reflection. This is a yes. ideal, uh, ideal uh, encapsulant. Exactly. But, exactly. Yes. But and and these two targets are not uh, opposite, so you can make both at the same time because in few a lot of area when you, you try to optimize both at the same time, they're op opposite or not. That is true. Um, I would say the target is less to have low reflections, but rather to have low specular reflections. Because if you diffuse the reflection, so scatter the light in multiple directions, then the reflections in a certain direction will be relatively low. And you can achieve that with relatively low transmission losses. So you still achieve a high transmission while scattering the glass. And I will show that after the break in the next presentation.